Uh, hello again. So as introduction to this panel about raising funds for e-commerce, I've been asked to make a little introduction about raising funds for e-commerce. So um, this is a very subjective presentation. It's based on my personal experience uh, of a consumer of this uh, entity and someone who raised funds several times. Um, just very quick, that was a digital agency in France. We tried in this case to raise funds by going in the stock market. It didn't work. And finally, we sold the company uh, to a big French uh, communication group. For NetBooster, we raised funds successfully and uh, we went out, we got our exit this year by selling the company to WPP. So this one is a good exercise. And for Cash Cash Pinoy, we already raised funds two times, one with Love Money and one with a Serie A. We will talk about that later on. And we'll see for the exit what will happen. And I had also another company called Attitude Studio. Um, we raised a lot on this one, really a lot. Uh, I left the company in 2002, and I think the company has been sold in 2009, something like that. And this one also worked quite well. So when you talk about raising funds, uh, you get inside the matrix, meaning forget everything which is artificial, uh, suddenly, you're not talking about engagement, you're not talking about commitment, you're not talking about uh, buzz or whatever. No, you jump in a world where what matters, it's figure, it's data, it's sell. You're talking to people, whoever they are, who don't care about the buzz. They are going to give a valuation to your company with cold blood. So you jump in another world. That's something we will talk after. Maybe it's not good to raise funds. It's not a necessity, actually. So you have to choose. In some business, you don't have the choice. You have to raise funds. I mean, a company like Amazon raised, I mean, raised like millions and millions during many years before starting to be profitable. And if they didn't, they would have closed earlier. So first thing, who can raise funds? Which type of company can raise funds? Um, today, it's the DCOM. So of course, we are talking about startup. So the definition of a startup, it's very subjective, there is a lot. I just pick up that one because I think it's quite clear. Uh, the idea is really to have a model that you will be able to repeat and which is a scalable one. Or else you cannot grow. And if you cannot grow, you don't interest any investor. So saying that, um, I'm sure you see that type of things quite often. Even now, when it's supposed to be the crisis, there is still a guy who raised funds. Oh, very nice. Bye-bye. Oh. Yep. So it's nice cover, and probably it makes sales of the magazine, but that doesn't work like that at all. So I think there is five myths about startup that uh, we should, right here, right now, erase. Number one, startup costs nothing to build. Number two, startup guy is uh, 25 years old, uh, Ivy League style, uh, coming from top school. Number three, you know, the magic story of Skype who raised uh, 10 million of US dollars on a napkin in five slides or something like that. Um, yeah, maybe it happens once. A good idea. It's not a successful one all the time. That doesn't mean anything. You have a lot of other parameters to take in consideration. And last but not least, um, location is a key thing. All business are not plug and play, and all business doesn't work wherever you plug it. So first thing, the startup costs nothing to build. Um, nope, it costs money. It costs money with obvious costs when you have a company. You want a startup, people say most of the time in digital, it's what? It's laptop and people. Yep, you steal money for the laptop you still need, but most of all, you need good guy. You need to hire them, find them, convince them, and if you want them to stay, you need to pay them well also. 
in any case, you have infrastructure cost. Even if people say, oh, it costs nothing now, you go in the cloud and suddenly it's magic. No, no it still costs money. Uh, number three, I mean, I like this one. It's like the bus can do all the job. God bless the social media and things like that. Mm -mm, not at all. Social media can bring, can support something, but at the end of the day, you really want traffic, don't stand by the bus. So it's just a few among others. Uh, so my call on that, it's the people who will tell you it's cheap to build a startup, uh, they never build a startup. They never try to launch their own company or else they were seriously loaded. And it's their money that they put in the loop. Um, the second one, this is a business only for this 25 years old guy. Yeah, of course, this is the benchmark of a, a lot of people. But actually, if you check the data, the average US founder is a 40 years old guy. He's married, he has kids, and he's not coming out from school, actually. He works in six to 10 years in business. So my call on that is what matters, actually, it's the quality of the people, where, wherever they are coming from. Actually, we keep on saying that e-commerce is a disruptive business. So it would be weird to look for pattern in a business which is supposed to be disruptive. Uh, yeah, this one is my favorite. If you have a good napkin and if you are completely passionate, that's the key of the success. Um, this is a quote of uh, Pandora. Pandora currently is a radio in US, online radio, and 8% of the uh, music listened in streaming in US are from Pandora. And actually, it's quite interesting because Pandora survived to more than 300 VC rejection. So trust me, the napkin is not enough, definitely. And at this point, it's more than passion that you need. You need to convince people with objective element. Passion is a necessity in any case, but for sure, the napkin will not work. So for me, it's more that type of quote when you jump into this business. It's blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Uh, good idea win every time. Actually, it's not so wrong. In e-commerce, everything is online. I mean, you want to check the UX, for example, of a checkout page which checkout page convert the best. You just go on Google, you tap checkout page, and you will see a lot of comment of white paper, of blogger, of, uh, I mean, you will see everything there. So you don't have to invent anything in e-commerce. The key thing for me is really the quality of your execution. Most of the time, you don't invent anything except maybe sometime there is a revolution like the video involved and suddenly a lot of things change. But at the end of the day, it's always the same rule. So I think more than a good uh, idea, the key thing is really the execution, the timing, the perseverance, and something I'll come back after, the Zen attitude. So I think what really matters, it's not necessarily the idea, it's more the ability of the CEO, the guy who lead the business, to be focused on one key idea. Found your business model. Found the pattern. Found the matrix who works. And that's your only job, to my point of view. So location doesn't matter. Yeah, I think there is nothing more wrong. The plug and play doesn't really work so well. And there is a lot of example of plug and play company who try in China or even in Philippines and who, as of today, still have issues. So whatever is your business model, you need to be able to adapt it to the local specificities. It's really uh, local. That's the key point. So that's maybe not the most uh, popular things, but actually, it's not fun in the Philippines for that. It's harder. It's harder because, I mean, since two days, we're talking about the lack of infrastructure, the, the issue and things like that. But just to give you an, an, an example among others, um, one of the key things in e-commerce is your traffic. 
I mean, if you don't have guy in your shop, you don't sell. That's a basic rule. And one of the beauty of e-commerce is your ability to optimize your ROI. One of the key things in Google is your ability to recruit exactly who you want, where we want. That's called geotargeting. So, for example, in New York, you want to recruit guys on that street. It's possible. Google allows you to do that. Not in Philippines. As of today, Google doesn't propose any geotargeting. So we were talking earlier about uh, group buying business, which is really uh, Metro Manila centric. So that means when you recruit guy by Google, you recruit guy from Mindanao, Dabao, Cebu, which are not technically your key buyer. But you don't have tool to do better. Because as of today, the tool doesn't exist. So yes, it's harder in the Philippines. But the pro on that is there is a lot of opportunity, of course. So now that we are talking about Philippines, the first thing is how can you raise funds? Once again, this is just my personal experience on that. Um, it's a little provocative, but raise funds only if you need it. When you raise funds, you inject in your company a lot of new problems. That doesn't mean it's not nice. It's like getting married. It's beautiful, but in the meantime, uh, you create new problems that you didn't experience before. So the first thing for me is raise funds if you need it. If you can do without, do without. And even businessly speaking, your exit will be better if you can do without. Some business don't have the choice. Some business must raise. It's like that. But that's the first thing. So how can you raise funds? Um, once again, there is a panel after, so I try not to get too much in the detail, but roughly you have three doors to knock. Um, the first one, we call that the love money. So to make it simple, you borrow money to your friend, your tita, your brother, your uncle, your uh, school friend that you didn't talk to since 10 years ago. I mean, everybody, you get the money. Um, most of the time, this is limited money, limited amount, and it's when you have only a business plan. This guy, usually, they have a high level of trust in you, and they can give you a little to start. Uh, the second door to knock is the business angels. Um, it's people who have money. They are not specifically connected to you, but they are ready to invest money. But this guy, except a few which are really, really, really loaded, they will not put millions of US dollars on your project. And the last one is specific company. Uh, who are set up to invest. We call that venture capital. So this guy, uh, there is a lot, it's a, it's a total landscape, meaning you have guy who invest only in biotech, guy who will invest only in e-commerce, guy who will invest only in projects who are scalable in several countries. Some will invest only a month from one to five. Some, if you don't come with a need of 10 million, they will not even talk to you. It's a very organized uh, market. So I tried to make a little mapping I think it gives a, a, an idea of what you can expect and what you can expect uh, based on the different type of population. So I didn't really talk about the love money because I think it's quite clear for everybody what is love money. So I was more interesting to be focused on uh, VC uh, versus angels. What's the advantage of one? Uh, what's the issue? So most of the time, a VC who will get inside your company he will request to have a share of the control. That means he will request a board seat. Uh, he will be part of the decision when a VC, will, uh, sorry, a business angel will be more on the side. He will consider himself more as an advisor than an active uh, guy who takes part in the decision. That is also reflected on the money they invest, of course. A VC will always take 20 to 30 uh, percent of your company, except of course if you are a huge machine and you are making your like Series F C D E round, and in this case it's different. But most of the time that's what they will request. When a business angel will invest less, and it will take only one to 10 percent of your capital. Um, of course, when you put several hundreds of thousands or millions of US dollars, uh, you're clearly engaged in what's happening in the company. 
So a VC will be more active. When a business angel will be, actually it's really intuitive personality, meaning it will depend on the guy. Some guy will be really involved because they know very well the business or it's just their passion. Some guy will just invest and you know, they will just request one email per month and see what's happening. But in the two cases, it's really a question of uh, meeting. I mean, in both cases, it can be a really nice experience or it can be a total disaster. It depends a lot of the quality of, of the relationship you will be able to set up. Um, what else we can say about VC, which is the highest level in terms of investment? The good point is they have deep pockets most of the time. So that means if they decide to jump into your business, they can follow you. If you need to scale, they can be there for you. Um, they can prov you, pro provide to you value add. It can be in their portfolio of contact, uh, portfolio of other company that they have invested in. Um, most of the time you have also professional of investments so they can help you in the strategic planning and, and a lot of other things. They also, of course, bring in the table uh, their experience. I mean, they invest in a lot of company. They saw the mistake. They saw also the good decision. It's valuable also. And one thing also which is important, um, they don't invest in niche business. You need to have a certain size of your potential market to attract this type of people. Actually, I think this is kind of important because DCOM, of course, is Filipino focus. And uh, this morning when we talked to uh, Under Secretary Domingo, we, we raised that, that point. That's probably one of the issue now that the startup e-commerce uh, ecosystem, uh, one of the issues we are experiencing. To make it simple, if you are looking for 50,000, 100,000 US dollars, there is door to knock. Uh, some of the people we are going to talk during the panel, um, there is a, a lot of door that you can knock now for that type of amount. The problem is when you need the second round, as of today, there is almost no one. So that's the tricky things. Uh, there is not a complete ecosystem as of today in terms of investment. But some things are changing now, actually. When you talk to a uh, Singaporean, Hong Kong guy, uh, Australian, uh, Chinese, even Russian fans now, they start to be really active when it's about Southeast Asia. And by Southeast Asia, I mean Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, and Philippines. I'm not talking about Korea, which is already a mature market. They are really now interested to invest in project, in company, in this market. Uh, probably, I mean, based on my contact, 15 months ago, they still have doubt. There was not a lot of case studies to reassure them. But now I can see that a lot of things have changed. And actually, um, if you just give a few phone calls to some guy, you will see now that there is funds really focus on this market, which is First, a very good news, that means now you have door to knock, but which is also a huge shift compared to even one year and a half ago. So, okay, what do you do if you want to raise funds? So the first thing is you need a strategy, definitely, uh, because you go to war. It's not something that you are going to make with a snap of finger in, in two weeks or even in two months, actually. So you need to know exactly how you are going to organize that, who will dedicate time uh, to that, um, what's going to be your message, what's going to be, what are you ready to accept and, and not accept, which is connected to planning. Because raising funds, in any case, it's six to 12 months. Some people will tell you, yeah, yeah, we can do it in three months. The truth is between the committee, the due diligence, the negotiation, the whatever, no. You have to take that in consideration, especially in our business where sometimes cash flow is a key issue. The second thing is, uh, for me, the third thing is organization. Per based on my personal experience, once I screwed, I was too much focused on the fundraising and not enough on the daily business. So finally, you consider that raising fund is an end in itself. No, it's just a mean to develop your business. The key thing is the business as usual. So when you raise fund, you have to be careful to keep on maintaining your business as usual. Um, 
I was talking about the napkin. And yes, you need more than a napkin, actually. You need a complete pack. So the key thing is, of course, executive summary, your business plan, and the presentation you will introduce to the guy. These are like Bible. This is the thing who will trigger a lot of things, starting by the meeting. Without that, actually, don't even contact a guy, because even if he's interested and he's saying, why not? We could push forward. Next sentence will be, send me some data. I'll send you an NDA. And then, OK, can I talk to you in two months? I need to prepare my data. Um, another thing, be patient. You have to stay zen. You're going to talk to a lot of different guys. Some guy will destroy your business model. Some guy will propose you things that you judge completely crazy based on your experience. Maybe they are wrong, maybe they are right. Uh, but I'm just saying it's going to be a long road. You are going to talk to different people who all have a different opinion on your business. Sometimes based also on benchmark that they saw somewhere else. Some will say that you have too much people, you have to cut your cost by two. Or you have to divide your team by two, which is for you impossible. So it's definitely a, a zen uh, approach. So in a nutshell, what are they going to look for? Number one, a big market. You are talking to guys that consider that there is a market if it's billions, not if it's millions. Most of the time, these people put money because they expect a high leverage in five, six, seven years. So if you tell to the guy, put one and I'll give you two in like five years, uh, end of the discussion, they expect five, six, ten um, feedback, return. So definitely you don't do that with a niche market, which is good. In Philippines, there is a big market. Uh, the second thing is why your company has a competitive advantage regarding the other one. Why your company, why you? The third thing is the quality of your business model. I mean, um, you need to be able to show that there is a traction in your business model, that even if you lose money, for example, your revenue are drastically increased. Actually, in some cases, it's better to have a company, for example, who make only 10 and the month after, the year after, who will be 20, even if you lose money, than a company who do 10 and do 11 by being profitable the month after. In some cases, the guy will look for the traction. Um, you need to show that you have something that the other one doesn't have, something unique. It can be a technology. It can be the quality of your business model. They also consider some subjective uh, element, like the quality of your brand, your position in the market. Most of the time, people used to say that if you are not in the top three, it's complicated to convince people. Definitely in digital, team is the key. So the quality of your team, your ability to attract guy, and as I said earlier, to keep it will be taken in consideration. Um, I call that interper interpersonal chemistry. That means at the end, you're talking to some guys and they are talking to you. They know that your business plan, you said most of the time you propose business plan for the three coming years who have an idea of how will be the market in two years. So they will judge also the ability of you and your team to adapt yourself to the change of the market. I mean, we were talking this morning about the roller coaster. I think Jojo has this image. Uh, it's a kind of that. How will you be able to adapt your business, your team, your organization on all of these changes? Last but not least, uh, they want you to tell them a story. They need to see that you have a view, not only a snapshot of the situation right now. They want you to say, OK, this is how I think the market will move. And this is what I'm going to do to take advantage of, of that. Once you have all these things, uh, you have your pack and you contact the guy. I mean, we could talk hours about that. And that was not the plan of this introduction. But you will discover over Joyce starting of the meeting, how to get the meeting with the guys. Um, if you don't have introduction, it's complicated. Actually, there is even some intermediary who introduced to founds. Um, but if not, 
I mean, you have to be persistent. Uh, the pitch, there is a lot of, of things about the pitch. Most of the time, these guys, they see 10 guys like that every day. So how are you going to show them that they have to listen to you, that you have something that the other one doesn't have? It's a presentation, it's a deck, deck in itself. Then you have the due diligence. If they are interested and start to negotiate, they will start to check if what you're saying is true. If your cells are true, if your data are true, if your figures are true. You will discover the joy of the valuation also. I mean, okay, I'm going to put money in your company. How much are you going to give me of your company in exchange of your money? So if I give you two million US dollars, what's the percentage of the company I'm going to get? And on that, there is a lot of different method and process to compute this valuation. And, they also, and you also take in consideration some subjective parameter. It's kind of tricky, but it's the key thing because at the end of the day, that's how much capital you will keep. And it's key after for your exit or your next round. And then the term sheet is the final thing. That's where the amount is, the condition, uh, what you commit to. Um, that's the type of thing most of the time people are not really careful about because they think once they got the money, part of the deal is done. But it's not completely true. I mean, does the investor can put you out or no? In some term sheet, you're protected about that. It's, uh, it's kind of part of the shareholder agreement. But it's something you have to take in consideration also. When you are agree on the money, that doesn't mean you agree on the term sheet. Just to give you an idea, with WPP, between the moment we were aligned to sell with them and the moment the sale has been made, it took six months of negotiation. So it can be a challenge in itself. Despite that, definitely that's the moment to jump into e-commerce. Um, that was one of the goal of the objective of this uh, DCOM summit. It was really to show to people that there is definitely opportunity. The market is here and not is coming. It's already here. Uh, Dave's presentation this morning showed that Filipinos are now ready to buy. They are just expecting proposal, offer. I think that's one of the reasons why this flash sale still deal are so popular. They wanted to buy, they just didn't have any opportunity to do it. So they jump on the first serious organized opportunity for them, which was this DLC. Now, just one last thing, because I think it's also something that you have to take in consideration. It's true for any business, but I would say maybe for e-commerce, it's even worse. Don't expect anything fairness about that. Meaning it's not because you do everything by the book that you think you have a good call that you will be able to raise funds. There is no rules about that. Actually, I like this example. You have Nikola Tesla on the left and Thomas Edison on the right. Uh, two are great inventors. They completely change uh, the business. One die completely broke and one die billionaire. So it's not because you're a good entrepreneur that you will have the skills or you will have the chance to raise funds. Thank you.